Good morning. Welcome to uh, Avoiding Legal Pitfalls. Uh, as you may know, I've been giving this presentation for uh, gosh, eight or nine years, but we now have fresh scenarios, so we will be able to torture you with the uh, Socratic method and tell you why you're right or wrong when you take a guess at the answers. Uh, my name is Peter Temple, and I'm an attorney at Kennett Square, and to my right is... Hi guys, I'm Jacqueline Motel. I'm an attorney at Fox Rothschild. Good morning everyone, I'm Emily Abels. I'm also an attorney in Kennett, um, and really glad to be with you all today. What we'd like to do is to um, encourage a discussion back and forth. You don't need someone in tie to lecture you for an hour, um, or at least one time. Mm -hmm. um, but we'd like to make sure that you feel like you have input and go through the process. The answers aren't important, the questions are as far as I'm concerned. And what's better than talking to an attorney when you don't have to pay for it, right? <laughs> you get paid? Sometimes. <laughs> That's terrific. Okay. Jack, do you want to start off with number one, uh, the core legal concepts, and we'll go through some of those? Sure. So today, um, today's agenda, we're going to cover some uh, basic legal issues regarding nonprofit boards. And then we're going to go into, as Peter said, some scenarios. There's, there's a, a handful of scenarios at the back of the slides. We're not going to get to all of them. So if you take a look while we're talking, if you want to zone out, I don't blame you. And just take a look at those scenarios. If there's anyone that of particular interest to you and your organization that you want to make sure we get to, obviously let us know. And as Peter said, we want this to be interactive. So even if it's something that's not going to be covered necessarily in our slides, but you have a burning question, please ask us. We're happy to you know, steer the conversation appropriately. So um, once we go through the core legal concepts, we'll do the cases and scenarios. Interrupt us at any time, um, again, if you have any burning questions. So what's the business judgment rule, Jacqueline? <laughs> So with respect to the business judgment rule, what we're looking at here is this idea of 2020 hindsight, right? So if you make a, an informed decision while you're sitting on a board of directors um, or operating as an officer of the organization, um, you know, as long as that uh, decision was made in good faith in the best interests of the corporation and taking into account reasonable inquiry, skill, and diligence, you're typically not going to be second guessed at the end of the day by a court or the Attorney General in our case, right? Nonprofits are subject to review and oversight by the Attorney General. Where the business judgment rule helps us, again, is the idea that you make a decision um, that turns out to maybe be the wrong decision, right, on behalf of the organization. And so the business judgment rule comes in to sort of save you as a board member, provided, however, right, that we've met those qualifications of good faith, reasonable skill and di uh, diligence, prudence, which is really another way of saying that we've met our fiduciary duties as a board member when making decisions on behalf of the board, uh, the organization. So what are those fiduciary duties? And I'll turn it over to you guys. There's three of them with respect to nonprofit organizations. Emily, your turn. Yeah, so we're going to start thinking about um, the duty of care that every board member has when they're serving. Um, so obviously, as Jacqueline said, there, there are three real duties to think about here, a duty of care, a duty of loyalty, and a duty of obedience. Um, we'll get to those other two. Starting with the duty of care, um, it really means that as a board member, it's your job to be informed. It's your job to ask good questions um, and to make sure that you have a sense of what's happening in your organization um, inside and out. Uh, you need to, as a board member, make sure that you are uh, securing independent advice um, when necessary, when you're in sort of a um, situation where maybe you don't know. For instance, um, if you're like me, you finances are not necessarily something that are an easy, uh, understandable um, set of spreadsheets for you. Uh, so when I became a board member, I, I tried to work really hard to understand how budgets were calculated and to seek out um, additional support in that area so I would know whether or not um, the organization was in a good spot. Uh, so that's something to, to think about is making sure that you're asking all those right questions. Um, and then we've also got this point here that you know ensuring that accurate information reporting systems exist, that's another part of your duty as a board member. So even just not only asking questions in the moment but making sure that the systems are in place internally so that there are checks on, on how things are running. Uh, duty loyalty. So this really goes to common sense in that 
if you were a member of a board of directors of a nonprofit, you have to put aside your personal needs and your professional interests and place the interests of the nonprofit ahead of both of those things. Um, there's a lot of careful, careful discussions we have to have about uh, board members engaging in financial transactions. Jacqueline mentioned it earlier. Um, essentially, it has to be done in a business-like fashion. And frankly, my experience has been that if someone does work for the nonprofit that they're board, on the board of, they have to A, be fully transparent, and B, charge less than the going rate. Uh, and of course, the other issue which is on the slide is confidentiality. You cannot use what you know on the board for your benefit or to uh, appear to disclose uh, secrets to the outside world. Jacqueline. Yeah, and um, I think, you know, the other thing I would just add with the duty of loyalty is to Peter's point, it doesn't mean that you can't, as a board member, engage in financial transactions with the organization. You really need to look at, though, again, what is in the best interest of the organization? So, for example, if you have a board member, let's say, whose specialty is something that is really in line with what the organization's mission is, and it is in the best interest of the organization to engage that board member to provide a service, let's say, and there's nobody else who can provide the same level of service to your organization, those are factors that you need to weigh before you engage that individual. And then to Peter's point, you know, you have to, obviously the individual discloses it, and then they recuse themselves from the deliberation regarding whether you're going to proceed with that person. So it's not um, an ab absolute prohibition on engaging in transactions with board members, but it is something that you really need to consider before you take that leap. And it's also something, just so you know, that is going to be highly scrutinized most of the time by the IRS, especially if the value of the transaction is, is significant. Okay. And then, oh, sorry. Go okay. ahead. And then the last um, duty is the duty of obedience. So this is the idea of complying with federal, state, and local laws and regulations, um, as well as being uh, truthful to the mission of the organization. So you know a great example of the duty of obedience is you know this threat of mission creep, which I'm sure you've all seen in boards that you sit on. So for instance, the duty of obedience could be violated if your articles in your, your purpose clause says that you your purpose is to feed the homeless in Philadelphia, and now all of a sudden you want to go across the bridge and feed the homeless in New Jersey. Technically, that's not allowed because your purpose clause is so limiting, and now you violated the duty of obedience by improperly expanding the scope of the mission without taking other necessary legal steps um, in order to do that. So there are two questions that everyone should ask themselves when they are invited to join the board. Uh, the first is, do you have directors and officers insurance? Emily, explain why that's important. <laughs> um, so directors and officers insurance, um, perhaps you already know something about this. Uh, so this is something that protects board members when you're serving um, for a nonprofit board. It also protects the organization itself in a way. Um, securing <clears throat> uh, liability coverage, um, employment related coverage, um, or if there's even potentially some improper action taken by somebody on the board. Um, so as you'll see on the slide, most employment, or excuse me, most uh, claims for directors and officers coverage are employment related. Um, and if there's not, uh, if there are not employees of the nonprofit, it's still a good idea to have directors and officers insurance. Um, it's probably pretty affordable if there's no uh, employment issues that come up. Um, so it's worth looking into, asking, making sure that's in place, understanding the coverage um, limits and uh, details there. Um, but I, often there are questions about directors and officers, so we can talk about that maybe at the end as well. But. And the only thing I'll add about DNO coverage is we see a lot of organizations that have non-voting board members. Um, we really uh, do not recommend that practice because we have seen DNO providers um, deny coverage to non-voting board members. So what we always say as well is why would you want to sit on a board if you can't take a vote, right? So those non-voting board members, anytime we see those, we convert that to, you know, give them a title that's something that doesn't include the word director or trustee, right? Make them an invited guest at board meetings when and if you need them. So that way you retain that relationship, you know, maybe it's a 
um, you know, somebody who's really institutional in terms of their knowledge that you want to retain that relationship with, but we also want to make sure we're protecting our volunteer board members um, in that regard. Does that include advisory board members? So an advisory board is typically considered a committee of the board of directors, and those people would be covered under certain committee coverage for a DNO policy. Um, advisory board members are not considered directors under Pennsylvania law, though. So as long as you don't, you know, I would say muddy the waters in your own bylaws by trying by basically giving them certain rights that directors would have. I think you're good. Okay. How emeritus? Um, emeritus? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's a great title to give somebody, you know, to show that you value their their prior commitments to the organization. We just want to make sure that they're not per perhaps emeritus board members or emeritus directors because then you potentially brought them back into that non-voting director bucket. Um, so, you know, a, a meritus advisor or something like that is typically, you know, semantics at the end of the day, hopefully we'd be able to get over that. Um, but it just provides some extra protection and avoids the issue. But I think if someone's named an emeritus director, they're part of the, uh, they're part of the bucket of liability, in my opinion. Emeritus advisor, some other title that way to avoid having to deal with yeah, I guess my only point is, though, that if you're an emeritus advisor, say, and you're invited to all the meetings, and you're asked your opinion about things during the meeting, you may not vote, but it's tantamount to being a director, in my opinion. It could, could, you know, lawyers aren't fair. <laughs> Sorry about this. But if we can drag you in, we'll drag you in. Yeah. And so <laughs> these are distinctions that might make sense today, this morning here, but in the real world, it doesn't work. So what would you recommend for those folks who are uh, maybe valuable to the organization? What would, what would we call them or call them nothing? <laughs> My favorite thing to do is, is to have um, you know a donor um, excellence circle or something to that extent where you honor people for the time or money given um, with maybe a particular you know title in terms of you know top level donor or whatever you want to call it. Another thing that I like to do is like I said before, have an advisory board that's con considered a committee of the board that reports to the board and then that way because they're a committee member they should have that DNO coverage um, as well. And, oh, just, just one final note to add on that and I think Jacqueline touched on this but it also brings up the importance of making sure you have carefully crafted bylaws um, so that there's not any confusion about um, a board member, uh, the, the definition should be pretty precise then about what constitutes a, a board of directors member, what constitutes an advisory committee, um, how committees are formed under the board, that sort of thing. So good idea to take a close look at those. So we talked about the two or three things that any new board member asks of the board. We talked about DNL coverage. Uh, I should have mentioned you also can see the bylaws. And the third thing, which sounds uh, prosaic is are you are the withholding taxes paid on the employees that work for your nonprofit <laughs> yeah um, making sure that taxes are paid is is a very good way to keep the nonprofit out of trouble um, so obviously you know that that sounds basic but um, it's something that would be a, is a critical function of the board and of you as a uh, member of a board um, the other of course, really important, but we would not be doing our job if we didn't bring them up, um, even though they may seem obvious. Important liability issues are that, of course, as a board member, you need to show up. You need to participate. You need to be an active um, and engaged board member, asking questions, getting that information that you need that I mentioned earlier. Um, you also need to make sure that you're not engaging in any mismanagement. So um, that includes negligence, We've got all sorts of terrible sounding words listed here. Negligence, carelessness, <laughs> <laughs> malfeasance, uh, all the all this terrifying lawyer terms. Um, but just making sure that you are um, not faking it till you make it, but asking all the right questions so that you are a competent and engaged board member. And then, of course, this conflict of interest. Um, I imagine you all you know, are also familiar with this idea, but when you join a board, there's usually a conflict of interest um, disclosure that you'll need to make. 
uh, noting if you are a significant donor or board member of other organizations or any possible um, interest that could run counter to that of the board you're serving on. Um, and so you need to keep in mind all these fiduciary duties you have and, of course, act always in the best interest. The only thing I'd add to that would be um, uh, maybe it's so common that I don't need to mention it, but you need to have a sexual harassment policy. And most importantly, you need to have a hierarchy of reporting so that if an employee feels that they're being sexually harassed, they know who they, they can speak to uh, and report the incident to that person. If you don't have that laid out, in my opinion, it could really cause a problem down the road. Yes? Can I ask a policy question? Um, so if you were recently joining a board where there wasn't clear policies laid out, so you mentioned sexual harassment, but looking at non-discrimination, yeah. um, all those things, what would your recommendation be for making sure there's a base level of the appropriate policies? I mean, does it go straight to a law firm? Is there, what recommendations would you have? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, the IRS asks about two policies in particular, the conflict of interest policy and the whistleblower policy, which, you know, incorporates sexual harassment, right? So those are two policies where if you don't have them on your Form 990 return, you can't check that box that says yes, right? And then you get put in a separate pile. So those are the two that the IRS seems to care about the most. I'd say, you know, also there's there's other policies, like you could policy yourself to death if you wanted to, um, but really good ones to have are usually gift acceptance policies, um, you know, just to have a procedure for what types of gifts uh, you're going to accept, um, you know, when to involve counsel with respect to complex assets. Um, another good policy is a record retention policy. Um, that's something, I mean, all of these you can find online as well. If you don't have a conflict of interest policy, the IRS actually produced one several years ago. Um, we use it uh, for our clients because it's cheap, obviously, and um, it's been rubber stamped by the IRS because they created it, right? Um, another policy that we see a lot of, especially in today's age, are lobbying uh, campaign activity policies. Um, just to you know, make sure that an organization uh, isn't being seen as acting through its employees and volunteers in terms of lobbying or engaging in political campaign activities. Um, but to your question, you know, what policies do you need is really going to depend on your organization and what it does. I mean, do you even have employees? If not, maybe some of the policies you wouldn't even need. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, the lawyer's answer is always going to be it depends. But I would start with the two that the IRS asks about. Yeah, and I think that um, on a 30,000 foot level, you, you know, you're trying to do good and you're joining people who are doing good and you don't want to appear to be <laughs> making trouble as you walk in the door, but you're also doing them a favor. Because although it might, they might not want to hear it, um, bylaws that protect you protect them. Um, so it, it, it's, a <laughs> it, it's, a, uh, it's a fine line to walk. Yeah, to I'm least. usually a double-edged sword as a board member. They love to hate me. They don't want me to raise my hand or ask a question because it creates more work for them. But at the end of the day, to Peter's point, you're doing them a favor. I usually don't get asked back after everything's fixed. They're, they're just don't. Jackie, I'd ask you back. No. You know, I, I, I would. Okay, we like to jump into some of these scenarios. I, I have this silly approach to this, which is that I divide the room up. So the five of you are on one side of a case, and the rest of you are on the other side of the case. And I want to, we all want to push you on what, what you suggest and why. So why don't we read number one together? During COVID, the board began to hold its monthly meetings on Zoom. A board member who had missed more than half the board meetings pre-COVID is now missing most, all of the board meetings. The board member makes an extremely large annual donation to the annual fund. Besides thanking that board member for all the money, what should the board do? What do you think, Emily? So I think that the, you know, any any time you are a board member and you're not showing up, that should already be ringing some some bells of what we've talked about this morning. That's a major red flag, um, and I think it gets to what Jacqueline was just talking about, which is that uh, it's it's not only a liability for uh, the director themselves who's not present, but that's also um, potentially a liability for the organization because you're, you're someone there who's not providing a check and balance on what's happening. Um, so that's, that's point one here, but I want to make sure we hear from other folks. So what are some of the things that come to mind for any of you hearing that? 
What are some concerns? I can. I this, this left side of the room is the. You're obviously the smarter ones. I can. <laughs> what do you think about this? This came up before me. What would you do? I, uh, initially, I'd probably just have a in-person conversation with this individual and you know tell them the expectation is we need you to participate. We need you to be engaged, and <clears throat> hopefully that corrects it going forward. But. Um, you know, the, the donation's important, so I don't want to separate with that person, but try to correct them and bring them back in a little bit. Maybe finding them a different role instead of being on the board, being a, like a committee member or volunteer or something Advisor. instead. Yeah. Good, and maybe starting good. a conversation with a wellness check, because sometimes people just, something happens in their life, and if it's, you know, if there's any concerns in that area, mm -hmm. it's less of a, you're not doing your job, and it starts out at least more of a, you know, hey, I'm worried about you, is everything okay? Right. And then yeah. segue into the conversation and alternative roles. Yeah. I love the approach of, you know, trying to do right by the individual, right? To not make it seem like they've let you down, but to start, you know, first with a, hey, are you okay? We haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? And then the other way you can add value to them mm -hmm. is to remind them that they have fiduciary duties and that, you know, if they can't commit to this, it's best for them to potentially resign or have some other role given to them because of those fiduciary duties that we just talked about. You know, <coughs> lack of action is also a violation of fiduciary duty. You don't have to actively participate to do something wrong. You can also just not be present. And that, you're still not fulfilling your fiduciary duty. So, you know, obviously I never like to start with the law because that can turn the conversation a very different way. But, you know, if you have the conversation the right way to tell the person, hey, you know, this is a liability for you personally too. Like, if you're not committed, I'd really recommend that we find a different position for you. Okay, number two. You got a question over here? Sorry. Well, another thing too is you can um, sometimes uh, organizations have a minimum board attendance policy that you can point to annually to say if you miss a number of meetings, you can't remain on the board. So it becomes the policy, not you, you know, trying to navigate that and, and uh, yourself. But the policy kind of dictates that if you have a minimum attendance requirement. Yeah. And I just wanted to make, um, put in a plug for your sexy personnel issue, number one. Just want to make sure that we get to that because there's a lot of fiduciary stuff going happening here. So, so this scenario, um, just for everybody, it's uh, on the, the last slide, it's number one, I think we have it up now. So it's asking about, you know, you have the executive director who wants people back in the office, they feel like they're not, you know, really um, performing at the level that they were pre-pandemic, they can't be monitored as much. Um, so, right? Am I on the Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> and, and so the staff, though, is pushing back, saying that, hey, we can do our job remotely. Um, you know, where does that put the board in terms of fulfilling their fiduciary duties, and what's the board's obligation here to sort of serve really as a mediator um, in this type of situation? So since you asked the question, you get to tell us your thoughts first. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe I shouldn't have done that because nobody's going to ask a question anymore. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> So this, the um, challenge for me is, is knowing the line between you know sticking your nose in and putting your fingers in, right? Um, so okay. I'm the concern is that some important key staff are threatening to quit, which really impact the viability of the organization. So. Um, and, and the CEO has really floundered in this decision. So I, I don't know. I don't know what our our duty is, except to give some different perspectives um, and then have her make the choice. <laughs> we yeah, all I, I think the board's in the middle, really, because um, I, I agree with what, what, what Jackie said. You want to try to facilitate a solution, but ultimately, you know, the buck stops with you. And if and if the fact that people refuse to show up is demonstrably affecting the, the, the effectiveness of the, of, the, of the organization, you've got to either get happy with it or get rid of them. And I know that's not much of an answer, but really the buck stops with you, not with the employees. And I think, you know, you got to weigh, just like everything, you got to weigh all of the factors here. So in your example, you have key employees threatening to leave right? Mm -hmm. And you have the CEO claiming that they're not working at the same level, perhaps, as what they 
Or I guess, sorry, that was or, the scenario. Yeah, yeah. One, or the CEO claiming that, you know, we'll make some exceptions for these individuals, but not for everybody else. Right. 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 That becomes a potential litigious <laughs> yeah. issue. Not great. So, not, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, this is something that's happening all over. Right. It's not a nonprofit issue. There's right. no great answer here. Every organization is going to be different. Um, you know, but I think one of the big factors are, as Peter said, is there a, a demonstrable change in the operations of the organization such that, you know, we can show that this is not working, right? That there is a need to bring everybody back. And alternatively, you know, another fact to consider is, are we going to lose key, key, key employees that especially given the market right now, are going to be very difficult to replace in a way that is going to have an even greater adverse effect on the organization's operations than just letting people stay home and work, right? So there's no good answer and everybody's gonna be different, but those are some of the factors that need to be weighed while dealing with this new phenomenon that we've created for ourselves. Uh, just one thing to add to come back to 30,000 feet is that as a board member, I think the thing that would guide me if I were in your shoes here is um, your duty to the organization and what's best overall. Um, and so Jacqueline laid out some really important factors of how to consider you know, what is best. To me, what you've laid out, and this is just my two cents, is that it would be important to maintain that, those staff um, and, and try to find a way to keep everybody happy there, um, especially if they're in skilled positions that will be hard to replace. Um, but <clears throat> that's, yeah, thank um, you. What level of detail would you have to show how productivity or effectiveness has declined? You really like if you were going to get into a real battle here, would you have to be like super specific, like start doing percentages and measuring stuff, or can you just argue from a higher level? Like, any idea? Is it... that, that's a tough one. Can I jump in? I have, yeah, that... I have a client that has a national organization, and he has found to his chagrin that his productivity has gone up 20% with people at home, and it upsets it not upsets him, but. It, it disappoints them because right. yeah. he yeah. wants them to come right. back into the yeah. office. Right. And you know, maybe they're they're watching cartoons and on their in their pajamas, but they're still doing the work. And so it's really it's a hard. fundamental philosophical question. I uh, I think like law firms are a good example, <laughs> where there's there's synergy by people talking to each other. And you run into the face halls with partner, yeah. the Rich Caputo, hey Rich, what about this case, right? And Rich goes, Oh, let's do that. And uh, you lose all that when someone's in their pajamas watching cartoons. But uh, it's, I don't have an answer for it. I think like, as a board, I think it, sometimes you, you kind of muddy stuff up when you get involved with staff. Because uh, our, 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 I think as a board, our, you're the ED's or CEO's boss. And we, and, and, and we empower the CEO or ED to make decisions. And 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 and, and we're, then we have those conversations on that level. The other stuff just gets murky. Uh, I think we, we you know, I think you have to say, yeah, we approve of what you are doing and saying, or we, we say, uh, and, and see how it comes out. And you know, you're this, you know, you're, you're responsible for this, whatever. Uh, and then you evaluate the ED at a later date again with what comes, up, what the outcomes are. But the, I mean, if, if you're dealing with staff, it's you, every staff member, right. it, it's going to get it gets crazy. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and as a board member, you don't want to be involved in the day to day, right? Because that that increases your liability personally as well. So you know, as a board member, your obligation here is to work with the executive director to come up with the policy for the organization, not to come up with specific you know, solutions or to have specific conversations necessarily with each and every employee. So I agree with you, yeah. All right, want to go back to the... Um... So I was thinking the online fundraising probably yeah. okay. might be a good one. Let's talk about that. That's on the, that's yeah. on the, the second slide. On the second slide, mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll do a, a fundraising one just to so that we don't spend too much time on any one particular topic. So we look at number one, it's talking about using sh social media and GoFundMe um, to raise money. And a board member is wondering whether this 
raises any legal issues. So does anybody raise funds online here? Show of hands. Yeah, most, most people probably do. So um, what, how do you, Mary, for instance, how do you raise funds online? What systems do you use? Um, we use GoFundMe. Um, we use our website. Um, okay. you know, we're, we're a small nonprofit animal rescue, so um, you know, specifically target um, previous adopters. And, um, As a previous adopter, you do a very good job. Of <laughs> <laughs> a, a little four-month-old puppy from Mary. Oh, he's adorable. It's a conflict of interest. Isn't it? yeah. <laughs> She's not on my just oh. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we do a lot of, of funding, you know, through our website and people donating via Venmo, PayPal. Okay, great. And is everybody familiar with uh, state solicitation registrations? No. Why would we? <laughs> well, as a board member, that's okay if you said no, because hopefully your organization itself is. But basically, in order to fundraise in 42 states, including the District of Columbia, you have to register with that state's attorney general in order to be able to fundraise residents of that state. So it doesn't matter where you are, it matters where your donor is. And online donations become very interesting because you can reach much further than you could with boots on the ground, right? So online donations, how do, we, how do we think we handle those then? I mean, would you think that you have to register everywhere? Uh, would you think that you had to register only once you got a donation? What do you guys think? When I tried to go into individual states, the individual states have different requirements as to whether or not Yep. Okay. It's super complicated. And for small nonprofits, it's actually really um, prohibitive from you guys being successful on a nationwide basis. Um, most, you're right, every state's different. Some states require you to register before you receive a dollar from that state, such as California and Illinois. Um, and then some states, like Pennsylvania, have a minimum threshold for donations. But what's interesting is that those states that have the minimum thresholds they're talking about donations on a nationwide basis, not just from residents of those states. So, you know, if you got $20,000, you've now triggered registration across the country in a lot of those states with that $15,000 threshold. Um, or is it 25? I don't know. Um, so, you know, it's something to be aware of that some states take the position that the Donate Now button is an active solicitation of that state's residents. So what we typically tell clients, especially small nonprofits, because it is insanely cost prohibitive to register on a nationwide basis just to have a Donate Now button on your website. So what we always tell clients is if you are really just focused on Pennsylvania, just say under the Donate Now button that you only accept donations from Pennsylvania residents. And that way you've limited the states in which you have to register. Or maybe you say you only accept from PA and New Jersey. Or maybe you say we accept from PA, New Jersey, and then you list every other state that doesn't require registration, just in case, right? <laughs> and that way you've avoided the issue and you've helped yourself be able to reach those local donors online so you're not knocking on doors or hoping they show up to an event, right? But you're also not shelling out thousands of dollars annually for all of those state registrations. I just talked a lot and I didn't <laughs> mean to. <laughs> Do you guys have anything to add? It's well, just a question we get a lot. So, so you put on your website that you only accept donations from Pennsylvania and then you get a $5,000 donation from Nevada. Do you have to turn it back? So I would argue no. And why? Yeah. Why do you guys think? Because you don't no. solicit it. Specifically Yay. said we only get it from PA. That's my coworker. <laughs> 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 but she doesn't do this type of law. She's like patent or something. It's just I something. Man, I got the litigation stuff. <laughs> I know where <really. laughs> Right, so you didn't go out and ask for that, and you specifically said on your website that you don't accept donations from Nevada, right? From Nevada residents. They came to you. I would argue that that is not an active solicitation of a Nevada resident, and it doesn't trigger registration. But what does? What comes after that that might trigger registration? A follow-up. Oh, thank you note? Know? Not necessarily the thank you note, but what happens when somebody gives you money? What do you put, put them on the mailing list? list? Put them on the mailing list, oh. and now you're actively soliciting them. Yeah. 
Is there a dollar amount threshold <laughs> that like states look at? <clears throat> so if I get, I don't know, five hundred dollars in donations from New Jersey residents, we have to be registered in New Jersey. So uh, some states, again, it's, it's zero dollars, but a lot of states, I think it's either fifteen or twenty-five. I can't remember wow. grand. Okay. But it's on a national basis, so it's not just did you get twenty-five grand or fifteen or however much it is from that state's residents. Okay. Typically, what we try to do is we try to approach it in a rational manner because you know, there, you know, you always weigh the risks, right? And like as a lawyer, I shouldn't sit here and tell you to violate the law. You got him on camera too. Yeah. But <laughs> what we would typically say is if you get $500 from New Jersey, maybe don't register yet. But if it's continuous and it's growing, maybe we decide to register in New Jersey, right? And then what you want to do is maybe keep those people off future mailing lists and see if they keep coming back to you without you reaching out to them. Okay. And I'm not to disagree with Jacqueline, but I think if it says donate now, except we don't take Nevada residents' donations. And someone sends it five thousand dollars. I think that the disclaimer and fine print at the bottom of the donate now green card would be a. I could see Nevada arguing that that it was on the website. It was absolutely. It was all over the the, the world, and therefore uh, we would have to register Nevada. Just another viewpoint, uh, unfortunately. Fair so. enough. Yeah. If how much are they actually monitoring and prosecuting for that? Type of Cases or small cases? We've had clients get prosecuted here in Pennsylvania for failing to register entirely. In Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. Well, that one, yeah. Yeah. Know. And Florida as well. In Florida. And we've also seen a big crackdown if you use professional fundraisers or fundraising council. Those are people who are not your employees or independent contractors who assist you either with creating fundraising material or campaigns. You know, they're like consultants basically. Or they actually go and make the ask for you and get paid to do that. And in those cases, those people also have to be registered with the state in order for you to hire them. And then there's contracts that have to be in place and reporting, and it becomes a whole mess. But if those people that you hire aren't properly registered, that is a huge uh, th uh, enforcement issue um, here and in New York and Florida we've seen. So. And on your 990s, you've got to disclose that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so I think this is number three then on that uh, fiduciary responsibility. So you serve on the board of a large, well-managed 501c3 organization. The CEO has decided to run for borough council, a part-time position. Their leadership on borough council could provide tremendous benefits to the nonprofit. What concerns does the board need to address? How much can the board support the CEO's run for borough council? There's my law firm over here. What do you guys say? <laughs> Good anyone, idea, bad idea? Has anyone had this situation? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we, we have, but yeah. Um, someone we haven't heard from today have any ideas on this before I jump in? Well, I think it comes back to the, the duties. Right? Mm -hmm. Are you violating, as described, loyalty in particular? So what if the nonprofit thinks, gosh, it's really great to have Jackie on, on the borough council and has also be uh, on our board so we're going to donate five thousand dollars of our of our endowment to further her campaign. And the, and the board says, you know, I know it's a lot of money, but having her on borough council will help our hospital. It's before they knew about all the skeletons, though. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring those up. I yet. see some head shaking. No, tell me why this does not pass the smell test for you. Well, a lot of times you have to say that we're not we're not doing any campaigning political. Yep. The five C three status. I mean, you can't. Bing, bing. You can support a cause. You can't support a person. Yeah. Right. Uh, did you have something you wanted to add? Same thing. Yeah. Right. So actually, this you know supporting a political Sorry. campaign is something that really could put your five hundred one C three status at risk. Um, so that's a that's a pretty big problem for you as a board if you're thinking of throwing your money behind your CEO running for office, even if it's just borough council. What can um, I do it individually as a board member? Good question. What do people think? Yeah. What's your individual? Mm -hmm. As long as it wasn't made a condition of your yeah. contending on the board. And that gets back to that lobbying and political campaign activity policy that I mentioned earlier when you asked about policies. 
you know, if you have a, a board that's made, or employees that are very active in lobbying and political activities, it might be a good idea to get a policy like that that sets forth that, you know, with respect to lobbying, a nonprofit can engage in insubstantial levels of lobbying, but you want to really monitor that so you don't want your employees just going out there and saying, hi, I'm the CEO of whatever and I'm lobbying on behalf of them, right? You want to monitor that so you would have a policy that sets forth you know, lobbying and when it's acceptable and when it's not, and then also a complete prohibition on political campaign activities when the individual is acting in their, per, in their capacity as a representative of the organization. They can do whatever they want in their free time, but it, they shouldn't be using you know, their company email to do it, the company Facebook, anything like that. Don't wear the name tag that says CEO of whatever, right? So those are the considerations that would go into a policy like that. So, Penn Health System is bought Chester County Hospital. And Chester County Hospital's board of directors, and I don't know this for personal information, let's assume that they are more advisory <coughs> than anything else, that all the doctor salaries and everything else is done by the, the uh, geniuses in Philadelphia. So, uh, the advisory board gets to the government and says, you know, I really think that so-and-so, our head of surgery, who's on our board, should, be, should run for a state rep. What about that? Is that any easier? Is that harder? Is that the same? This is not a. This is an advisory board, not a real board. And again, I'm not saying I don't know. Or that think board. of it maybe as advisory committee. No, that's different. I wouldn't know if it violates anything, but it's still messy. So it still wouldn't pass a smell test for me. So. And it could jeopardize other donations. Yeah. Um. So. Did you have something? Yeah. Just, um, Say a board supports the CEO to run for borough council, and then the uh, and wins, um, and was done above board, no, no laws are broken, and then the CEO steers government business towards the nonprofit. It's on mission, but it steers and but it's not proper. Like something is wrong. Is the Board of the nonprofit liable, or is it just the CEO who was not doing what was proper? I love the verb steers. <laughs> 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 Would you explain what steers means? Yeah, I, I, improperly influences oh, okay. the, the movement of money to the nonprofit. What do you think, Emily? I mean, for me, I think that poses a problem. I assume that the board is uh, responsible for the oversight of the CEO's work there. And if I'm understanding your, your hypo correctly, it sounds like the CEO is uh, sending things back to the organization. So um, I think that that is, uh, with your definition of steers, I think that that's, that could be problematic. For the board members. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, for the board or the would it be council, the, right? Because council's the one who should be voting on the monies, and that's public monies that are being steered towards a private entity. So wouldn't more, and I'm not saying it's kosher on the, the nonprofit side either, but wouldn't it be more of a responsibility for council? I would think yeah. so, yeah. I mean, I, I'll... Hard to sue public figures, though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I would think so, and then I think, you know, to Emily's point, it just, I think the board obviously has a fiduciary duty to understand also its sources of money to ensure that the money isn't going to be um, considered imp an improper transfer that's going to be taken back. So I think maybe that's where the board responsibility really stems from, is understanding that this was done in a legal manner and that it can be accepted as opposed to improper influence that might cause the funds to need to be returned later. Okay. The gift yeah, acceptance the, the, policy, too, is something that might help. Right. Yeah, I think the details would really matter in that, yeah. that hypo about. So let's play with that hypothetical. Let's say that uh, your, uh, your chairman is elected to the, to the borough council. And they don't steer business to the nonprofit, but they make sure that the nonprofit knows to bid on certain things. Oh, yeah. Public bidding. Um, and, and there might be a little few whispers in the air that, that you know, if you if you're within the twenty thousand dollar range, you might get the deal, but that wouldn't be wouldn't really be directly uh, steering. Would that be okay? Doesn't sound. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> so the way he framed it. Right? <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Wait, wait. I have another one. Yes. <laughs> the big part of the other one: boards that recruit politicians to serve on their board so that they can get government money, and they do. 
I mean, many organizations have elected officials on their board so that they can get government money. Is there anything smelly about that? Or what controls them to be in place? But is there a link? I mean, if unless there's an overt link, how do you tie the two together? Is there what overt link? If there's an overt link, unless there's some, you know, connection that you can prove. Not to sound like a lawyer, but. That sounds like a lawyer. I don't know what to do with that. Now. <laughs> I would think that you can le you can leverage your board members, you know, influence, yeah. influence their specialties, their relationships with people as long as what you're doing is above board and legal. So. If you're, you know, you have somebody yeah. who's a political person or holds an office and everything they're doing is above board, but right. they have relationships with people to facilitate it, I would think that's okay. okay. I love the above board. You were steering an above board. See, beautiful words. Beautiful words, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right. No, beautiful <laughs> words, that's right. Vanessa. Yes, I have an, um, a, a broader question about duty of care sure. um, and the implication that we could expose ourselves uh, to more legal litigation. Um, it says board members need to secure facts and ask questions. When it comes to secure facts, does that mean, say, if there's an employee personnel issue, could we specifically ask for that individual's performance evaluation? If it's coming to the level of the board, I mean, we've already said that right. it, that's not a good use of your time as a board to micromanage every right. personnel decision. But if it's something that is stymieing the CEO and they've brought it to the board, I think you probably need all of the detail that's. Okay, and sure. getting that explicit is not increasing our mm -hmm. um, exposure. In fact, that's doing our fiduciary duty. Yeah, because right. you're, you're protecting the organization yeah. from a, li a potential liability, right? So actually, yeah. my week started off with a national nonprofit at, I got emails at 5 a.m. on Monday morning mm -hmm. saying they're going to fire their executive director. And then there was a 10 p.m. board meeting that night. So this all happened in one day. And so the issue was we need to not only provide adequate notice so that the, the you know, the decision can't details, be. Details, Right, the decision can't be undone because we didn't follow procedure. But then also once the meeting starts, you know, to your, to your point, the board members asking who are just being brought in, asking the right questions and understanding what has actually happened such that we can fulfill our fiduciary duty before we say yes or no. And so in those cases, now this was the CEO, so obviously the board has oversight over the CEO, but I think if it were any other employee too, if that, could, if that decision could possibly result in liability for the organization, you have every right to ask every question. Every, you have a duty, not only the right. Sure. I have a super basic question um, regarding the actual meeting itself and who should be present and when. So team members, employees of the organization, the actual board, the director, where's the DMARC in the communication, um, and who should, like, how should it run effectively in your, in your view? You mean a, a, just a regular board meeting? An so, annual meeting of the board. Or even monthly, quarterly, exactly. Okay. Like, so, you know, is the IT director sitting in the meeting with you the whole time talking about the audit? When does that individual leave? If the executive director is providing a readout, when does the board have opportunity to speak confidentially knowing that we're responsible for that director or other members. Like, what is the best practice for an effective meeting? Well, we can answer that, but I'd love to hear if other folks have an answer that they want to test out, and we can chime in. We have, um, if we want to have a private discussion, then we call in an executive session, and typically that's on the agenda, and that's where the you know, CEO is invited to leave, and then we carve out that 30 minutes or whatever. But um, for our, our board, we just have the, the board, but, you know, the, the directors, and then the um, if we're going to have a finance report, the CFO is there. So it depends on the agenda. But typically, it's just the board members and the executive director for our board. And then, for instance, that meeting I was talking about on Monday night, we wanted to establish attorney-client privilege in case there was any litigation as a result of the board's decision. So we had nobody who wasn't a board member, and then we have myself to establish that privilege. So it's all about 
what's on the meeting agenda? Right. You know, to, to is it Kelly? To Kelly's yeah. point, um, your sweater's kind of covering it. To Kelly's, <laughs> to Kelly's point, you know, if you have an IT report, yeah, the IT guy could come and give that, or they could give the report to the executive director and the executive director covers it, right? And then most of the time, you're gonna have your executive director there the entire meeting, and whatever ever staff members or invited guests should be there, and then if there is something that needs to be confidential or that needs to be attorney-client privilege, you go into that executive session and you ask those invited guests to leave. How do you feel about recording those meetings? Yeah. <laughs> We'd rather have someone s summarize them in the minutes. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. You have a good recording clerk, and that and that goes. Yeah. And th that gets approved before that's. Yeah. And I think the CEO should have the chance to review the transcript of the recording clerk or the video to make sure that all the highlights are hit. Sure. Thank you very much. Could I, is that the entire meeting or just an executive session? You say don't record. The entire meeting. Yeah, I would not record the meeting. Are you thinking? Are you? Is this coming from a place of COVID and? Yeah, Zoom so all our meetings are hybrid now, and our secretary takes the Zoom recording and does her minutes off of it. I've seen organization. Live. Yeah, I've seen organizations That's record really just yeah. for the sake of being able to then do the meetings later. Best minutes, practice. Meeting? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Best. The best practice is to not record anything, right? Because even if you record it and you destroy it, if you get into trouble later, you have somebody like Peter say, why did you destroy it? Yeah, I would. That's why I have your documentation policy that they're all destroyed. And like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before Peter can get them. That's exactly it. Meeting that it's destroyed before Peter. But where's your hard drive? <laughs> So yeah, so we, we would recommend not to. I understand, you know, from a practical standpoint, people wanting to record for the sake of doing the meeting minutes, but what you also need to understand with meeting minutes, I've seen meeting minutes that literally like verbatim are the meeting. Yeah. It's insane. Literally all you need to do is say like, J Motel discussed not recording meeting minutes, period. And that's it, right? And then you do the votes and you can say like action items. But that's really all you need. You don't then need that then Chaz and I had a conversation and this is exactly what we discussed. You could say discussion ensued and maybe if there's a really important point, you say, see Brogan, 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 Brogan. said this, right? So the meeting minutes themselves should not be, as Emily said, a transcript of what happened because then you might as well have the freaking recording, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Training your recording clerks is an important uh, part of board training in my perspective. Here's one that came up with one of our boards. <coughs> Number three on fundraising and donor accountability. The executive director is thrilled to report to the board that an anonymous donor is contemplating a $1 million gift to help with building renovations. <coughs> the donor's condition is that no one knows who makes the gift. As a 501c3 nonprofit public charity, must the board know the name of the anonymous donor? He's nodding. Thoughts over here? What do we think? Yes or no? Uh, Silence from this legal counsel side. <laughs> what do we think? What are you saying over there in the green I'm, sweater? I'm signing. That means yes. <laughs> You're signing. Doesn't somebody have to, one person at least, has to know the name of the person to be able to give them the, the donation letter? Right. You need it for the 911. Yeah. And so what if, they, what if he says, I won't give you, or she says, won't give you the money without total anonymity? If you pick up any college fundraising book, right. you'll see huge donations, a million dollars, yeah. anonymous. Was, yeah. that, was, that in, was that person who gave the million dollars, that there was, a, there was a person on the board who didn't know who that person was? One and person knows. Does that person, is that person required to do due diligence on the donor just to make sure that it's, like, you know, not drug money? No. <laughs> Could you put it under like a different entity of some sort? Could it donate through a, tr a trust? Yeah, potentially. Do you guys all as board members review the 990 every year before it's filed? Gosh, I hope so. Right? It's nodding. Good, good, because there's actually a box that you have to check on the 990 saying, did your board review the 990? And you know what's included in the 990? <laughs> Schedule B, which is the list of contributors. So you actually have to tell the IRS that your board reviewed the 990 in its entirety. You guys don't even open the link, do you? <laughs> reviewed it in its entirety, including Schedule B, which is going to list that donor. 
Now, I'm sure, as you guys probably did, since this is the scenario you had, is there's other protections that you could put in place to make sure that the information doesn't leave the boardroom, right? But unfortunately, in that case, that contribution has to be listed and it has to be referred to by the board. I have other things I could go into with legally why you, the board might want to know, but I'm actually interested to hear what you guys did in your particular case. It, it was my case, and we said we had to we had to tell the board the, the name of the donor because, to your point, there was no guarantee that it wasn't funds that were illicitly being, you know, uh, washed, and so uh, and and it still went through, um, yeah. although we thought it wouldn't. So I mean, it's sort of a, a meat and potatoes answer, but I think you, you know, you you you've got to be careful. Absolutely. Um, and you know another thing we talked about early on was the idea of engaging in transactions with certain individuals now this person obviously wasn't a board member but you also for IRS have purposes have to be careful about engaging in transactions with substantial contributors to your organization those are referred to as disqualified persons so if this if this donation was significantly large such that this person is now a substantial contributor and you don't know who they are, maybe they're also your biggest independent contractor, right? right? And now you have to check all these awful boxes on the 990 <laughs> that isn't gonna be good because you're engaging in transactions with disqualified persons. So not even knowing who the person is does you no good, especially when it's a very large donation that could have other effects, other lasting effects on your organization. Because once you're a substantial contributor, you're always, a, I think it's like 10 years you're a substantial contributor. So you always have to know everything about the donation, especially when it's large. So how about this scenario where you're a school, and I won't even say religiously based because then there's no 990, but let's say you're a school and you, um, you hire a, a large construction company to build a dormitory for the school. And you have a signed contract, it's a fixed amount, it's totally done, and the president of the contractor, contracting company comes in and goes, you know, you guys have treated me really well, I want to treat you really well, I want to give you a million dollars. What do you guys think? There's, there was no connection, but his charity, supposedly. <laughs> Kelly says yes. Kelly okay. Gets too no further questions. Then. <laughs> what do you think, Chris? Chaz. 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 Sorry. Um, you write very small. Okay. It's, right. it's yeah. intentional. Uh, I feel like if the deal is done and signed and locked in, is it from the company or from the individual? Individual. Individual. I'm okay with that. So. Even if it's a national company, you know, a Turner Custom, any big company. So I'm an employee, not a board member, so I'm all about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Does prevailing wage apply to private schools, or is that just public schools? I think it's just yeah. public schools. It's just public? I, I was just so. thinking from the RFP contractual mm -hmm. standpoint, and the governance surrounding what can be paid for and who, and all those pieces, if that would weigh into it. Are there, um, knowing that we're coming up on our time here, are there uh, burning questions that folks have? Or Wait, did you I'll give the answer. I'll give the answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's a million dollars floating around. Maybe there's enough. I think we are. I think we are. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, Kelly, I didn't mean to worry you there. <laughs> sorry, I thought we said that. Yeah. <laughs> it was already, I'd already put it in the bank in my mind. <laughs> this one happened to me. I want to read it to you. <laughs> I can still see the person's face. A board member purchases a significant auction item at a nonprofit's event on their credit card, and they were drunk. <laughs> That's not in the scenario. But we read between the additional lines. Additional facts. <laughs> the next day, the board member returns the item to the nonprofit, telling the executive director they want a refund on their credit card charge. The executive director calls the board chair for help. I don't want to hear from you, Kelly. Who else thinks about this? $10,000 painting, bought it. They were obviously, well, I mean, not obviously, but they were. Take it back. Take it back, please. <laughs> what do you think, Jacqueline? I will say legally, there's no requirement to return the funds. Yes. yes. A gift's but, a gift. A gift's a gift. Um, but, you know, in these situations, just like when you have a pledge that somebody's saying they don't want to pay, 
you know, the question is, even if it is an enforceable contract, right, or the money was already exchanged hands, the question becomes from a donor relations standpoint, a PR standpoint, what do you what do you do, right? So, you know, in this particular case, um, it's not yet reported to the IRS, but there is a paper trail, right? So it happened the next day. It's not like somebody came back the following tax year and says, I want this money back, right? Um, so, you know, technically the charity doesn't have to return it. Um, the IRS probably won't know about it. There's a paper trail. The facts aren't great. Um, the AG might find out about it, right? Because we're also subject to the AG, as we said. Um, so, you know, the biggest thing you can do here is you're going to have to make a facts and circumstances decision. You're not legally prohibited from doing it, but it's not great. It certainly shouldn't be a daily occurrence or even a yearly occurrence. And one of the ways you can avoid a situation like this is by having a really good gift acceptance policy in place that just says, you know, we don't do this, sorry. Um, and that it's known to, to board members and donors. Yeah, I, I think that's good advice. I only, only add that the person that wanted to take back the gift is a board member not oh. just a donor, and to me that really complicates yeah. it. That's true, that's fair. Um, it, it really, I, I think that I would probably be a little, not as generous as Jacqueline has been in this case. That's fair. Um, I didn't realize it was a board member. I didn't read the details. Good <laughs> thing I'm not a lawyer, right? <laughs> yeah. Sound like a lawyer. What did you do to your they, they wouldn't take it back. They wouldn't permit them to, uh, and, the, and the board member quit, and that was okay. Life goes on. Absolutely. I would like to thank you. This is always my favorite session.